I appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk to you. Uh, this is going to be kind of a ham radio thing, but I'll kind of just talk about software and Linux too. So I hope I kind of cover the gamut of everybody that's here tonight. If you aren't interested in radio and that kind of thing, and you want to get up and leave, you won't offend me. So <laughs> please do. Um, I'm going to start out, I'm going to discuss a little bit about what SDR, what Software Defined Radio is, how it works. I'm going to go into a little bit of the hardware, what's out there available on the market, both commercial, amateur radio. And then I'm going to get into this one cute little USB dongle thing that you can pick up for about $20 that will do a full feature software defined receiver for software defined radios. Uh, it's, not, it's not what its main purpose was made for, but we'll go into that a little bit later and I'll explain that when we, uh, we start. Um, and then I'll talk about software and I'll give some demonstrations on what we have. Uh, I, like um, they said, uh, I do have a couple of Raspberry Pi devices here uh, that are hooked up and we'll kind of go through that. We'll give you an idea of what you can do with this little $20 device. It's, it's pretty amazing some of the, the features that, that it has. And I also have some videos about what some other people are doing with these devices. Uh, there's everything from um, receiving satellite communications with a small dish. You can do a small dish antenna, connect these things to a, a small antenna array on the dish, and you can pick up satellite communications. Uh, it's amazing what these little things do. And it seems like every day on YouTube, somebody comes out with a new bit video about, wow, I can do this with this thing. So they're pretty, pretty neat. I think you'll uh, kind of enjoy it if you're into the radio thing. So. Uh, before I get started, I'm going to have I got some I have some pass outs to uh, pass out here, and I want to play. You wanna, yeah, you hand this out? I've got 24 of them. I think there's enough in there. Uh, before I get started, I want to play just a little video. This is from the TV show Last Man Standing. If you're familiar with it, uh, the producers of this show are ham radio operators, and they always try to work ham radio into the shows. And this is kind of a, a, an interesting little show they did. Uh, you're going to see two of the primary characters. One is Mandy and the other one is Kyle. Mandy and Kyle are dating. And Mandy's been, her grades have been suffering because of all of her electronics. So her parents took her laptop and her cell phone and everything away from her. So she's been going through social media withdrawal. She's searching the house to try to find where her parents put her stuff. And she's down in her father's radio room in his ham shack and, his, and her father's radio is on. And she happens to hear Kyle talking to his boss. His boss is in the rainforest in Brazil. And she hears Kyle on the radio talking to his boss. So that's what we're going to pick up here. Whoops. Hey, whoops. That's what I'm going to get one. Sound just like Mandy. <laughs> say something she would say. Kyle, it's me, Mandy. <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> no, seriously, it's, it's <coughs> listen, I've been so desperate to talk to you. Oh, Mandy, I was worried. I didn't hear from you. You didn't train in my tests. No, I'm sorry. My parents took away my phone and my computer. Oh, I thought you dumped me. 
was so bummed. My, my roommate sent me with his sister tonight. She's sweet, but she looks disturbingly like my roommate in a dress. Be careful, Kyle. I made that mistake once. By the time I figured it out, I was too revved up to hit the brakes. <laughs> software to find. Uh, the components that were once typically in hardware, like a picture, <coughs> pixel, bleh, like your mixers, filters, amplifiers, modulators, demodulators, and such, are instead all implemented in a software. And while the concept isn't really new, the rapid growth in digital, in the digital electronics has given rise and made practical many of the processes which used to be only theoretically possible. So as our processing power continues to increase, we can do a lot more things in software that we couldn't do several years ago. So, so that's why software-defined radios are becoming more and more popular because we now have the capabilities to do a lot of these functions, to actually create these functions at, in a software-defined situation instead of having to have all this hardware. Here's a kind of a comparison between the classic radio and, and the software radio. Your classic radio is a traditional piece of hardware that we probably are pretty much all familiar with. It has a hardware-based receiver and demodulator. It uses analog filters for the required application. And then it recovers either an analog signal or digitizes the demodulated bits. Well, in software radio, you have a more or less classic radio front end and tuner. But that's kind of where it ends. From there, the tuner actually, is, the down is the uh, IF frequency or the baseband frequencies coming out of the tuner are actually run through an analog to digital converter and process via an analog process via the software. Um, so that you actually have two pieces in SDR. You have a software component, you have your hardware component. Your hardware component is, is known as a USRP, a universal software radio peripheral. So if you hear people talking about a USRP, that's actually the hardware part of software defined radio. Um, and again, it uses the high-speed analog to digital conversion to digitize the IF or the baseband signal, and then uses digital signal processing for filtering, equalization, uh, and all the stuff that was done previous with the hardware. Here's kind of a basic block diagram. You have your uh, antenna input, comes into an RF front end, some kind of a, a tuner. Uh, usually has some kind of a low noise amplifier and LNA on the front of, end of the tuner. Goes through your analog to digital conversion. Uh, it may or may not have some kind of an FPGA. That's a field programmable gate array. And I'm not going to get into what FPGAs are here. If you want to know more about FPGAs, you can Google them. But basically, it's just an FPGA. Oh, my notes. <laughs> an FPGA is really just a matrix of configurable logic blocks. And those logic blocks can then be configured via software to perform almost any digital function. So you can do all your digital filtering, signal processing, all of that can be done through the logic blocks of an FPGA by just, by just programming those logic blocks. And then you have your uh, USB output, USB 2 output to your PC or your hardware. Um, you do have to have USB 2. That is an action, that is one of the only requirements to have software-defined radios that work only because the speed required involved with the data transfer, you have to have that kind of speed. Uh, USB 1.x won't work for you, and not, not that there's much USB 1.x out there anymore anyhow, but, but that is a, an absolute requirement. So if you're interested in doing anything with software-defined radio, you need at least USB 2.0 or 2.x. 
Uh, and then from the PC side or the software receiver side, the software just runs on top of your operating system, whether that is Windows or Linux, it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, just like runs just like any other application would. So there's nothing really special about the software side other than that, that you just have a, an application that runs on top of your existing uh, OS. So what are the advantages? Well, obviously they're software defined so they're much more flexible. Uh, as long as your tuner frequency, your analog to digital conversion sampling rate, and the computing power are sufficient, any receiver can be implemented in pure software without hardware changes. Now that's a biggie. That's one reason our government, the, uh, especially the military, they are really pushing software-defined radios because they can put hardware in their, in their vehicles and they can go out and change the software and by just changing the software they can change the functionality of the radio system. So they're really big into this because they think it's going to be you know, something really great that they, you don't have to go out and tear a whole radio out of a vehicle every time you want to change maybe a function of that radio system. And then the decoders can be designing the software with the ability to handle both audio and visual modes. And I'll show some of that a little bit later too. I'll show some uh, decoders. Yes. Does your dongle have like an antenna connector on it or yes. is an antenna built in? Okay. It has an antenna connector. And that's actually what, this thing's plugged into one of the dongles, this antenna okay. here. So. Is it a one-way or two-way? Is there a two-way part to it? Your diagram had it coming in. No, it's just one way. Okay. Yeah. I'm, uh, there are transceivers out there, and I'll go into a little bit about transceivers, but I'm going to be focused mainly on just this $20 dongle, which is just a receiver okay. only. So the hardware and OS requirements. Um, Multi-core CPUs are highly recommended. You should have a CPU with a large cache. Uh, some examples are Core i3, i5, quad cores, Intel Core 2, Duos, MVPMs. Uh, at least four gig of RAM. Again, USB 2.0, we've already discussed why USB 2.0 is required. And then Windows XP or higher for 32-bit 32, uh, 32 or 64-bit. I'm running uh, Windows 7 64-bit on the laptop here. Or you can have Linux, and again, both of the uh, Raspberry Pis that I'll show you later, they're running the uh, Raspbian Linux, which is the Debian 10 point something. <laughs> I don't know which one. Um, now the four gig of RAM requirement, that's only a requirement if you want to do a full UI, if you want to have a full-fledged um, console type application. If you don't want to run a full UI, you can get away with a lot less RAM. I have, you know, both of these Raspbian Pis that I'm going to be showing here tonight are just 512K. They work fine. They work great. I can't, however, run any of the UIs on them because they just crash. It just drives them into the dirt. So, <laughs> so if you want to run a full-fledged uh, UI, then you do have to have that kind of memory. Uh, if you're just going to, you can run off the command line. You can, there's, there's some applications out there, some software that will allow you to do command line access to the device. If you want to run a command line, you don't need that kind of memory card. It's, it's been that way already. Right. So as far as amateur radio transceivers, what's out there on the market for transceivers? Uh, there are a couple of manufacturers that are making them, Flex Radio Systems. They make three models. They start at 650 and up. The uh, Flex 1500, the 5 water is the 650. The other two are the and up models. Uh, the last time I checked their website, I think the Flex 3000 was going for 1600 and the Flex 5000 was going for like $3,000. So, you know, some serious money if you for a transceiver. Uh, and then Softrock is a, another company that manufactures uh, a transceiver. Now, they manufacture a transceiver kit, and this is a QRP. If, you're in your ham radio, it's a low power transmitter, it's a one watt transmitter, and it's only offered in kit form. And I have there, it's $89 a band, but what, what, I'm really, what I really meant to say there, it's $89 per kit. Yes? Uh, five watts is QRO. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a QRP. <laughs> I think anything under five is <laughs> QRP. <laughs> Um, so they have, uh, it's a kit form, and you can, with the kit, you can make any one of those models of receiver, <clears throat> but you can't make more than 
one of them. So if you want to run like 80 meters and you want to run 20 meters, you have to buy two of those kits because you can't make an 80 meter and a 20 meter transceiver with the same kit. So if you wanted to run 160 to 10 meters, you'd need at least four, you'd have to have four kits basically to do it. So you'd have four kits sitting on your desk for, uh, for 160 to 10 meters. Now it's, no, it's not too bad. <laughs> as far as general coverage receivers and amateur and commercial use, um, there are thousands out there, I think. It seems like every time I search for them, it seems like there's a new company popping up that's making one. Uh, and they run the gamut of price range from you know, $11.99 down to about 201 The FunCube dongle, that's the one that uh, a lot of the ham radio operators are, are familiar with. Um, that's a pretty popular one. It is made in uh, England, so it's actually 124 pounds, but depending on the exchange rate, it runs about you know, 200, $201, whatever the exchange rate happens to be at this time. Um, and you can see most of them have a pretty wide frequency range. The front tube dongle goes from 1.15 to 1.9 gig with a, a pretty large gap from 240 to 420 meg. Um, the rest of them, also have a pretty wide frequency range. So how about software? We've talked a little bit about the hardware. Almost all of the software out there for SDR radio is freeware. <laughs> so you know it's not going to cost you a lot for software. It shouldn't cost you anything for software. Uh, there are, again, there are a bunch of companies that are making software. This is just a few of the more popular ones that you'll find out there. There's some Linux, uh, there's some Linux, there's some Windows. Uh, there's Windows Linux, the uh, SDR Sharp, or SDR Pound. That's a, that has, they have a Windows and a Linux play with that. I have that software with me tonight. I will demonstrate that software. I'm gonna be demonstrating it on Windows, but it, it works exactly the same. It's identical on Linux. So you can get that for Linux. Um, the reason they call it SDR Sharp is because it was written in C Sharp. The people that wrote the program wrote the, wrote the program in C Sharp. So that's where it gets its name, SDR Sharp. And, we'll, and I'll show you that. And, and we'll, do a, we'll have some demos here. So what about the consumer market? Is there anything for SDR on the consumer market? Well, not exactly. The closest thing to SDR for the, on the consumer market is this little guy. The RTL DDBT USB tuner. It's actually designed to receive digital video broadcast terrestrial. That's what the DDBT stands for. And this guy is uh, made to plug into the USB port on your PC. You load up some software, and you can use your PC as a TV, as a as a HD receiver for HD TV. However. It's HDTV for the European market. DVB-T is all a European standard. It's used entirely in um, most of um, Western Europe and Australia, and I believe some of Asia uses DVB-T also. Just being um, right now, well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, doesn't the satellite spectrum use DVB or is it the satellite spectrum? Yeah. It? No, it's it's low frequency. This is DVB-T is lower frequency than satellite. Um, this is just an over-the-air, just like your over-the-air you know, HDTV. Um, but it is not, it does not do ATSC, the American standard for HDTV. So you can't run right out and buy one of these things and plug it in your laptop and think you're going to pick up over-the-air HDTV with it. It won't work. It's only designed for the European market. However, it does have another function <coughs> that we will get into. Um, when you buy one of these things, if you want to get into this, again, they're like $20 on eBay. When you buy these jobs, you get basically a little plastic bag. You may or may not get a disc for it, a software disc. I have purchased probably five of these things, and I've never gotten software yet with them. So <laughs> <laughs> They say it comes with software, but you know, don't believe them. You don't need the disc. Please do not install the software. You're not installing a TV receiver on your computer. If you install the software, it's not going to do you any good anyway. So don't even bother installing the software. There's special software that we'll get into that you'll need to use this thing as a, as a DVD-T or as a uh, SDR radio. SDR. Uh, but anyway, a kit, when you buy these kits, you get a little uh, remote control for your TV. 
Okay, that thing, what you can do with that, you can take the battery out, it's a CR2032. You probably have something in your house that uses a CR2032 battery, and then the rest of it can be pitched because it's worthless. <laughs> it does you no good. Again, you're not using it as a TV receiver. And they usually come with a nice little antenna. This is a pretty nice one. This is like a little rubber duct. It has a mag mount base on it and everything. It receives actually very well for what it is. It's pretty amazing how well this little antenna will receive. Um, but you get that. And then, of course, you get your, your dongle, the software, your USB dongle, which looks something like that. And again, I'll get into this a little bit more. These things come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and flavors. This is just one of the, the types of them. So this thing has a, basically has an antenna jack on it. Plug the antenna in, and you're good to go. Plug that into your laptop or your PC. If that software to find, where could you get the software if you go to TSC? Uh, it mostly because decoding ATSC takes a lot of bandwidth, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything out there that's. <laughs> Probably licensing. Well, I, yeah, I don't know if it's licensing or not. I mean, I know like with, like HD radio, you can't get you can't get a decoder that will decode HD radio either. But these things will pick up HD radio, and I'll show you that a little bit later too. But you can't get a decoder for it because there's one company that owns the rights to the HD radio software encoding and decoding, and to buy a license from them is about $150,000 just to license the software from them. So these people are making these HD radio receivers, these FM HD radio receivers are paying a lot of money up front for licensing for that. That's, that's exactly the issue with BTSC because that you have be. MPEG that's not free and you also have Dolby for the audio. Right. Yeah, so yeah, you, you may, that may be, it may be more of a licensing issue, although I, I was, I've been looking into it and it seems like there's a, you actually have a, a lot of power to decode that, so I don't know, maybe not, but. Is there an FPGA in that uh, dongle that does the decoding? The uh, DDBT decoder, I believe, is in the, encoded in the uh, FPGA. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably where it's being done, is in hardware in the device. Right, yeah, it's being done in hardware in the device, yeah. right. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. So there you go. Yeah. That's that's true. It's, it has hardware internal to the device that does the DVD-T decoding. So. Uh, probably the type of modulation too, because uh, our ATSC is eight eight VSB, as opposed to uh, DVB is uh, QAM two fifty six. Right. Right. It's probably conceptually a little easier to demodulate yeah. too. Yeah, I know, uh, like the HD radio, someone said, you know, if the FCC ever re requires all the radio stations to go to HD radio only, somebody in their company is going to be worth a fortune because they're the only ones that have the licensing rights for that software. So, what is a DDBT receiver? Well, it's basically uh, uses the Realtek chip, the RTL 2832U chip. Uh, there's more than 20 different devices from various vendors out there. Like I said, you'll see these things in all shapes and sizes. There's ones like chiclet size.